Good morning, and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen by way of our live streaming this worship service on Facebook Live. We have created a safe and socially distant space for worship. This service is now open to all with no reservations required. We do ask that you sign in before entering the sanctuary since we have to keep a record of attendance and masks are still required to wear inside the sanctuary. In case you missed last Sunday's announcement, we are back to singing hymns, but we do request that you keep your masks on. The continuing study on the rise of Gothic cathedrals in this Wednesday is this Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the Social Center dining room. There's a virtual option by Zoom, and you may click on the link from our website. I hope you can join Reverend Gary and Helen Burke-Kakowski. And if you're able, there is a blood drive on August 15th at the Social Center. A $5 Dunkin' Donuts gift card will be given to donors. Even if you are not able, please get the word out by sharing our flyer posted on Facebook. And after worship, please join us on the front lawn of the church for after worship refreshments. FYI, there will be no coffee. In case you haven't realized, I'm not Reverend Gary. Um, my name is Jennifer Ring, and I have been your seminarian intern this summer. Um, and I will be leading us in worship today. Um, I am from North Carolina, and if we were giving out a gift card um, for our blood drive, it would be Krispy Kreme, just to let you know. Um, I will be in attendance at worship um, on the 8th, um, just to thank you all for hosting me. Um, so if you don't get to speak to me today after worship, I will be um, here again on the 8th. Um, so I hope you will join us then as well. Um, and I also think it's funny, um, we would always have coffee, no matter how hot it would be outside. So, um, but um, welcome and thank you all for having me this morning. Um, if you would rise and, and join me in the call to worship. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all the Lord's works, and gracious in all the Lord's deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling, and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is faithful in all the Lord's works, and gracious in all the Lord's deeds. Let us worship God. Bringing. God is 
is calling and we hear. God is calling and we hear. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Most holy God, we confess to you and to each other that often we fail to be just in our thoughts and kind in our ways. Who we want to be and who we are never seem to line up completely. We frequently make choices that are cowardly and mean and certainly are not gracious nor merciful nor slow to anger. We need your justice and mercy, love and forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit to be made new. Amen. Through the grace of God, the resurrection of Christ, and the love of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. And those of you at home, please join us for children's time. My name is Susan, but some people call me Nana. Now, some of you at home may have a Nana or a grandma too. My grandson, Jaden, lives in Wisconsin. He's 10. And one day he came home and he said to his mother, my daughter, Mom, I'd like to learn how to play the ukulele. So Mindy was a little surprised. And then she said to him, well, Jaden, maybe you want to pick a more uh, popular instrument, like the guitar. And Jaden looked at her and said, and I quote, Mom, why would I take guitar lessons when I want to play the ukulele? Well, he had a point. So through a lot of searching, Mindy found a ukulele instructor. And Jaden went to his first lesson so excited. And the instructor, the teacher, explained to him what they were going to do, showed him how to do it, helped him place his fingers, and at the end of the lesson, Jaden looked at the teacher and said, I quit. <laughs> the teacher was really surprised and said, Jaden, why? And he said, well, I watched you, I listened to you, and I still can't play the ukulele. So the teacher looked at him and said, Jaden, I can show you how to play the ukulele, and I can tell you what to do to play the ukulele. But you are the one that has to do the work. So Jaden thought about it, and he said, OK, that makes sense. I'll try. So he went to several more lessons. He was showing that he was trying to be patient and he was practicing and doing the hard work. Now, I'm not going to tell you that he can play the ukulele yet, but I can tell you that he's a lot better. And when I called him and said, so Jaden, how are the lessons going? He said, you know, Nana, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. So that got me thinking about being a Christian. We know that Jesus loves us, and we know that Jesus is always with us. But I think Jesus is a little bit like the ukulele teacher. In the Bible, Jesus tells us what to do to be a good Christian, and he shows us in his actions what to be, to do to be a good Christian. But it's not Jesus that can make us do that. We have to do the hard work. 
We have to think about what he says, see about his actions, and put them into practice and do the best we can. And if we do that, I feel we are going to be in the right road to become the wonderful Christians that God wants us to be. So in Jaden's word, it might be a lot of work, but it's worth it. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you so much for sending us your son, Jesus Christ. Please help us to remember that to be a good Christian and to follow in the steps of Jesus, we have to do the hard work. But it will be worth it. Amen. <clears throat> Our first reading is from Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. is the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord. He is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. Now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord. I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. such a great song and then I'm going to follow it with a bummer of a scripture so I apologize <laughs> so thank you for that our second scripture reading is from 2nd Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 through 15 
In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to fetch her, and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went, to, went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. This is the word of the Lord. Again, good morning, First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen, and thank you for having me here this morning. I completed my first year of seminary virtually in North Carolina, so the first time I ever came to New Jersey was when I arrived the last week of May to begin my field education here at your church. And everyone has been so gracious and welcoming, and it has been a wonderful introduction to what hopefully will be a wonderful two more years at Princeton Seminary. I do not have any children of my own. However, many of my friends are concerned about their children matriculating into the next grade of school this fall. They are concerned that the impact of virtual education may have led to educational gaps or lack of adequate progress in their knowledge that will impact them long term. I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous about that as well. What will I actually retain from my church history class or my introduction to New Testament class or, let's be honest, Hebrew? And that is actually why I was excited to have the opportunity to preach on King David this week. In my introduction to Old Testament class last fall, we spent a lot of time dissecting the problematic ways that David is presented in the texts and the reasons why he continues to be the king in spite of that. I realized it actually retained something. Have you ever had a moment like that, maybe watching Jeopardy or doing a crossword? One of the scary things about being a second career seminarian is that you have what I like to call a before life. All of the things that came before you felt called to seminary. Because trust me, going to seminary at 41 years old was not on the life plan for me. I've had certain life experiences that mar the otherwise perfect figure that we sometimes have of leaders of the church. At least I know I've been guilty of the idea that leaders of the church should behave better than everyone else. I've been married and been through an ugly divorce. I am single with no children, not to mention that I am a woman and from the South, 
where there is still a large part of the population that believe women have no place in the pulpit. Perhaps the largest stain that I have is from the night of Super Bowl Sunday 2017. Leaving a friend's house with the intention of getting home by halftime, I jumped to the curb and ran head on into another car. Fortunately, I was merging on to the interstate and he was exiting, so neither one of us was going very fast and he saw me coming. But the impact was enough for the airbags to deploy and my steering column was crushed enough to where I could not remove the key the next day. You're probably thinking exactly what was true. My blood alcohol level was 0 0.015, almost twice the legal limit in North Carolina. The factual truth was I had begun taking a new medication the previous day, and while I had read the pamphlet that came with it that warned of mixing the medication with alcohol because it would speed and increase the effects, I ignored them. I suspect most of us normally do. So while I had carefully monitored the amount of alcohol I had consumed, I was not paying attention to the physical state my body was in. At 37 years old, I was calling my mother from a place I never expected to be at, the city jail, to have her come and pick me up. I was home before 9 p.m., embarrassed and ashamed and confused. What followed was almost two full years of consequences and lessons learned. Alcohol education meetings that cost $40 each, fines, community service, more fines, an ignition interlock device commonly known as a blow and go that cost $70 to $5 a month, more fines, and finally a complete ban on driving for 45 days before more fines to renew my privilege to drive and until November of this year, 2021, if I were to blow over a .04 at any time while operating a motor vehicle, it is an automatic DUI. Now you might be wondering, how does any of this have to do with David? This entire experience would have been different had I not allowed my ego to make the decision that night. Had I been humble enough to follow the instructions on the prescription pamphlet, none of it would have happened. Had I taken an Uber home or called my mom when something didn't feel right, it never would have happened. Our scripture today shows the many ways that David's ego drives the power that he has to behave in ways that most of us find egregious. The predatory manner in which he has sex with Bathsheba and arranges the death of her husband are both ways that he decides that he will get what he wants without caring about the consequences for anyone else involved, including the eventual death of the baby. The man that I hit that night was on his way to his job. His job was as a surgical resident at the teaching hospital in my hometown. He walked away from the accident and the only treatment he needed was a few sessions of physical therapy for neck pain. That is another lesson that I learned that night. I had been taking the grace of God for granted. What my Old Testament professors called cheap grace. However, we are never above the law. What I saw in this process though is that our justice system is not always equitable. What I had, what David had, is access. David has loyal followers that fetched Bathsheba and placed Uriah in front of a death squad. I had my mom. I wouldn't necessarily call her a loyal follower, but if you have or had a good mom, you know exactly what I mean. I happened to be living with her at the time, so I was paying no rent, but she would also have helped me financially in any way that she could. I didn't really need it though. I had a good job, so I was able to pay for the classes, the fines, a new car, the jump in the expense of car insurance. I did not have to figure out how I was going to add the monthly payment for the blow and go into my budget. I also had a boss that drove by my exit every day on the way to and from work. Not like Route 1, we don't, we don't have roads like that. <laughs> 
But for 45 days, I didn't have to figure out how I was going to get to and from my job. Not to mention, I didn't have to figure out how I was going to care for children on top of all of this. You might be thinking, people should just follow the law then. I would challenge you, why should David be allowed to have Uriah killed just because he wanted to be with his wife Bathsheba? Why did God allow him to continue to be king? Why did I get to walk away when so many others make the same mistake and experience a different result? In the biblical texts, it is because God has made a covenant with the people of Israel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 13 through 15a, the scriptures tell us, God says, David shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use with blows inflicted by human beings, but I will not take my steadfast love from him. I am ashamed of what I did that night, but I also tell my story freely. I want to educate people about the dangers of driving drunk, of course. I was also told in my alcohol courses that the average person drives drunk at least 10 times before they get caught. I also tell my story because many of the people I met in that process were not as lucky as me. One man lost his daughter. One woman killed a pedestrian. A young man lost his college scholarship and his admission to the college entirely. One woman told me she knew she was never going to get her license back because the arrangements she made to get her daughter to daycare would occasionally fall through and whenever the sheriffs saw her on the roads, they would pull her over and give her a ticket because the driving restriction is to and from work only. The fines were racking up and she didn't know how she was going to pay them. See, David did many good things. He was obviously gifted with political savvy and personal charisma. He unifies northern Israel and southern Judah and rules from Jerusalem, the city of David. But David had another side to him as well, just as I have another side to me, just as we all have other sides to ourselves. For me, I am extremely careful about alcohol and driving, obviously. But I also feel the weight and the blessing of covenant that God made with the Davidic dynasty while living out the rest of my life. We will all make mistakes, hopefully not those as egregious as David or even as me. But to pretend to live a sinful life, sinless life, is to be so drunk on power that we are only like one side of David. We have to acknowledge that is the reason for God, the Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in our lives. I think of my before life the way I used to think of my life outside of church. As we move into this hopefully more open congregational life after COVID, I would encourage people to be more open about their lives, their before lives and their after lives, your outside life and your church life. I believe that churches are places that can make a real difference in the world. I've been excited to hear about some of the things that this church has done to take a stand on issues that matter. But those things don't stop just because of COVID. My Old Testament professors likened David and Solomon to Constantine in the fourth century. Constantine made Christendom the religion of the land, assuming that they alone knew what was best for everyone, that using the basis of faith for power weakens the integrity of the faith. We need others in order to thrive. We need humility and humbleness. The challenge before me, and I argue the future of the Christian church, is we have to stop preaching about only the good stuff, the stuff that makes us proud to be Christians. We have to stop preaching about how David was punished and start telling both sides of the story of David 
and not glossing over why he was punished. The same way that I have to be authentic about who I am, the same way we have to acknowledge the truth about our country, our founding fathers, and all of our leaders. We have to ask, are we making decisions in order to prop up our egos and in an effort to retain power like David? Or are we making decisions in order to please God and help God's people also like David? We can and we will do both. Because I think that is exactly why God chose David. Because he is exactly like all of us. We can pretend to be Jesus and we should all strive to be like Jesus. But in David, we see ourselves and we see how the love of God will never leave us, no matter what we do. Amen. to take this opportunity to share with you a tradition that we was started at the seminary due to virtual chapel this year. We learned how to pass the peace in American Sign Language. The word peace is actually the combination of two words, become and quiet. So your hands change position and then slide out. Be with you. So peace, be with you and the reply, and also with you. So with that said, may the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. So please share our sign of peace with those around you. Pray with me. Glorious God, we come before you a weary nation, weary of the fear that a virus brings as we continue to feel one step forward and seeing two steps backwards. 
weary of the anger and divisiveness we see surrounding us each and every day. We come before you with the prayer for those falling victims to the out of control fires on our continent, the firefighters working day and night to control them, those that are losing lives and homes every day, those that are having negative health effects from the smoke that is traveling to the opposite coast. We pray that both human behavior can change to help improve overall conditions but also that there is an end to the immediate need soon. Caring God, we come before you, lifting up all of the members, friends, and family members that are on our hearts today. You know who they are. We pray for you to walk beside them in whatever way they may need you. We pray for the safety and health of all those involved in the Tokyo Olympics. Amateur athletes that have sacrificed so much for these two weeks that we get to enjoy from the safety of our own homes. We pray in thanksgiving for the abundant support of our food pantry, but pray also in lament for the need of its existence. Watch over all of your people experiencing food insecurity, especially the littlest of your children. We pray for all of those who have fallen victim to sexual violence and ask that you help us stand in solidarity with them and that you hold them in your arms. Finally, God who never leaves us, we ask you to help us recognize and face our both sides and work to be honest about both and realize and lie in the wonder that is your love for us in spite of this. Let us pray together as your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. out into the world, reveling in the gift of the love of God, despite our flaws and in fact because of them. Feel, feel a renewed sense of fullness through the forgiveness of the love of Jesus Christ and a full cup of peace through the Holy Spirit. Amen.